After going through the last video, which lays out the problem and the final results, let's go ahead and break it down in a little bit more detail so we know how to do problems like this on our own. First three questions we might ask ourselves is, what is the claim? What is the researcher's thought about the claim? And if we were to go out and challenge it, what questions would you ask the individuals? In this case, the claim was what we saw uh, from an external news source, uh, the report that said 60% of Rochester residents think that winter or say that winter is their favorite season. Now the researcher, in this case me, I thought that that was too high. I thought it was actually going to be something less than 60%. So the claim was 60%, I thought less than 60%. The researcher, in when you're doing a hypothesis, is not allowed to say things like, oh, I think it's 40%, or make a claim for a different number. They just have to say it's higher, lower, or different. Higher, lower, or different are your three options. Last one is if we were to go out and challenge the claim, what question would you ask the individuals? Now in this case, uh, the question I asked was, is winter your favorite season? So I would go to each individual, I would repeat the question to them, uh, collect my data in that way. That brings us to our next part is, what type of data are we working with? Now if my question was, uh, is winter your favorite season, then the answer is going to be yes or no, a category. So that's categorical information. Categorical information is summarized with a proportion. So I know I'm dealing with a proportion about whether winter is or is not the favorite season. The null hypothesis is always going to start out with a symbol uh, that represents, in this case, the proportion. So proportion for a population is summarized with a large P. And we always want to give our symbol a subscript so that we can be specific as to what we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about the proportion of people who think winter is their favorite season. So I'm going to give it a little subscript here that says proportion think winter is favorite season. You can keep this short, but the whole point is, is it helps you understand that this P actually refers to something. The other important thing about the null is it is a statement of equality. It's always P or mu is equal to something. And in this case, it is equal to the uh, proportion stated in the original claim, which is that 60% or 0.6 of the uh, population think that winter is their favorite season. The alternative is going to be the exact same statement that we made above. So I'm actually going to copy and paste it uh, completely uh, here because it is exactly the same as our null. We only are going to change one thing, and that thing that we change is the symbol, the symbol in red. We don't think that, as the researcher, we're the ones that make the alternative. We do not think that they're equal. We think that the proportion is going to be lower than 0.6. So before we talked about what the researcher can think, they can think that it's higher, lower, or different. Uh, in the case of lower, we would say less than. If it were higher, greater than. If it were different, we would say not equals. So in this case, less than. Continuing on, we're asked, what is a reasonable cutoff p-value to reject the null? There's a lot there. So what we're trying to say is, how unlikely do our results need to be before we are convinced that something fishy is going on? And so we have to decide what is the cutoff value. And that cutoff value gets its own symbol. We call it alpha. And the percentage that is typically used is 5%. So 0 0.05 is typically the p-value. Uh, anything below that is going to be rejected. Now, in order to actually perform this test like I did, we need to figure out uh, which test we're going to use in Stacky. Going back all the way to the first question, we asked uh, our data is summarized as a proportion. So we need to do, in StatKey, a test of a single proportion. The last one we need to look at is what assumptions we make before we do the test. Just like any other part of statistics, if you put in garbage data, you're going to get out garbage data. And an important thing to realize before you go out, collect your sample, and perform your tests is that you actually have a truly random sample without high under coverage, without high non-response, things like that. So in the case of uh, this scenario, I said that I went out and I took an SRS of Rochester 
residents going door to door of randomly selected households. Now, is there going to be some under coverage? Yeah, there's some people without households. Is there going to be some non-response? Yeah, there's going to be people that don't answer their door or people that send their dog to the door, whatever it might be. Um, as long as that isn't too high, we can assume that it's a sufficiently random sample and we can work with that. So that's the thing we always want to check for is, is it a random sample? Now let's jump into actually calculating our p-value. So to do that, we need to go to stat key. Once we're in stat key here, we have a number of different randomization hypothesis test options. And in the first two, we have test for a single mean and test for a single proportion. And those are the ones we're going to focus on for now. In this case, categorical data, one categorical variable, we go straight across to a single proportion. So when you open that up, you're presented here with some default data. It has some original sample in there. It has a null already in there. First thing we do is edit the data to put in our data. So in our case, we collected 15 people who said winter is their favorite season out of a sample of 34. So we type in our 15 out of 34. And here our original sample shows up on the side. Second thing we do, which is an additional step from the confidence interval, is we need to set our null hypothesis. We said that P is equal to 0.6 before, so we type that in here. And that's going to recenter our curve around that null. Now, if we generate one at a time, you're going to see each random sample is a little bit different. They tend to clump around the null hypothesis. We generate a few thousand of these. We get our large curve, again, centered around that null. Um, and we need to decide uh, which tail we're going to look in. So let's go back to the question we asked earlier. It says, which test? test and stack key will you perform? We said test of a single proportion. We didn't answer the second part, which is, is it a left, right, or two-tailed test? Because we are looking less than the 0.6, we are going to look in the left tail. If we are looking greater than, we look in the right tail. And if we are saying not equals, we would look in both tails and have to add up all that together. So let's go ahead and look in the, check the left tail. And what we need to do is adjust this slider on the bottom to match the proportion that we have in our original sample. We're going to do the same thing when we have quantitative data. We're going to adjust this value to represent our sample mean. We want to know the probability of finding our sample statistic uh, when we assume the null is true. So that's why we adjust this. With proportions only, we run into some weird rounding errors with stat keys, so we're going to actually switch this over into count. And instead of typing in 0.441 down there, we're going to go to the left tail and we're going to type in our original count of 15. Even if it already said 15 in here, you want to type it again because you'll see these bars are not always filled up. And by retyping it and hitting OK, it will give us a new number here that will be more accurate. So again, you can up your number of samples, your number of resamples to be a little bit higher and adjust that. And uh, in this case, it looks like it's about 0 0.05 as our p-value. Not great for an example uh, because 0 0.05 is our cutoff. So let's see if we can refine this a little more and see if it ends up changing on us. Um, we'll go with 0 0.048 after 12,000 resamples. So 0 0.048, that is going to be our p-value. You'll see it's floating right above. It's the probability that represents the red here, 0 0.048. Let's go back here, p-value, 0 0.048. We have to decide with this value whether we are going to reject or not. So we are going to compare this to the alpha we picked before, the 0.05. Is it less likely than 0.05? Is, is it smaller than 0.05? Yeah, 0.048 is smaller. It is less likely. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis. We are going to choose to reject the null. That was our goal. Remember, we don't like the null. The null was uh, trusting someone else's claim. The alternative is my claim as the researcher. So I want the alternative to be true. I want to reject the null. This is a good thing. When you reject, your data is statistically significant. So yes, it does make your data statistically significant. 
Last part says, state your decision in context in a short sentence. Well, if we had to describe what we found, we found that it is unlikely with our data, we have statistically proven that winter uh, is not the favorite season for 60% of Rochester residents. It is, in fact, less than 60%. So if we were to word this a little more carefully, we might say something like this. Winter is the favorite season for less than 60% of Rochester residents. We didn't say anything like it was 44% or tell people what our sample said. We just said that it is less than 60%. That's all we were looking to find. Last thing talks about, um, or second to last thing here, talks about what you should do or think about if you reject it or if you fail to reject. Now, we did not fail to reject, so we can actually skip this part right here. But this other part says here, if you did reject, what is the difference that you found between the sample mean or proportion and the claimed mean and proportion? And does it seem like a meaningful difference? Our null was 0.6, probability at 60% of Rochester residents think winter is their favorite season. Our sample proportion was about 44%. That's a difference of 16% of the population. I think that is a pretty meaningful difference. So we have a difference of about 16% between our data and the null hypothesis. And yeah, I would say it does seem like that's a fairly meaningful difference. 16% is a pretty large number of people. Now the very last part we asked ourselves is what if we made an error? Imagine you found out later that from a census of all the data that you made the wrong decision. Remember the decision we made was that we rejected. So this was our decision to reject. Now we have to decide whether or not that was the right decision. If it was wrong when you reject that is a type 1 error. If you failed to reject and that was the wrong thing to do then it would be a type 2. So in our case, because we rejected, if we made an error, that would be called a type 1 error. Now the way I like to think about this is when you reject, you are significant and you are number one. So if you reject, your data is statistically significant and you could have made a type 1 error.